Okay, so I was asked to, uh, so first of all, thank, thanks for inviting me. I'd like to thank uh, Althea and uh, Greg and Sarah. Where are you guys at in the room? Hi, you know, thank, Greg and Sarah were instrumental in inviting me. A lot of people don't know this, they got married three days ago. And so I escorted, escorted them on their honeymoon. It's kind of awkward. Um, so that's where I'm here. Uh, so a little bit about my background. Um, I got my uh, uh, Bachelor of Science degree in Organic Chemistry. So my background was in Organic Chemistry, Organic Physiology. Um, I got my medical degree, master's degree, and then I went on and did a uh, residency in family medicine. And then I got kind of bored and started doing a whole bunch of other stuff with interventional pain and uh, other things. And then probably about uh, 2014, I, I kept getting asked a lot about cannabis from my patients. And my knowledge of cannabis was just like everybody else in this room. I knew what I was taught when I was growing up and it was all bad. I was never really taught anything in medical school and so my answers were similar to anybody else would say, uh, you know, uh, when prescribing cannabis. And then uh, one day, one of my own GP patients came in, he had metastatic bone cancer and he came in with the paperwork uh, to uh, uh, register for cannabis and he was terminal, he was a palliative patient, um, he was on a sufentanyl pump and so I authorized his prescription, um, and I say this a lot. I say I did the right thing as a human. I did the wrong thing as a physician because as a human, I'm sitting there, and this guy's suffering. Sure, why not prescribe it? And I prescribed it at a ridiculous dose because I didn't know anything about dosing or delivery methods or routes of administration and so forth. And then my doctor brain and the, uh, kicked in and go, okay, what happens if he overdoses? What if there's drug-drug interaction? What if this guy dies? You know, and all that sort of worrisome set in, um, and that sort of forced me to learn about cannabis. And given my background in organic chemistry and uh, physiology, once I understood the mechanism of actions, the physiology associated with it, it made total sense to where I was to the point to where, why aren't we doing this rather than we're doing all these other conventional treatments instead. Um, so to start off, I'm actually American by birth. I live and practice in Canada now. Uh, my wife's Canadian, but uh, you know, one of the founding fathers of democracy, Thomas Jefferson, some of the finest uh, hours are spent on my back of veranda smoking hemp, observing as far as the eye can see. Um, so one of the founding fathers of our democracy. Right there. So why do we fear cannabis? And kind of going back to what I said is, you know, this is what has been instilled in us. And, you know, to quote Charles Darwin, a belief constantly instilled during the early years of life while the brain impressible appears to, be, to acquire almost the nature of an instinct. And the very essence of an instinct is that it follows independently of reason. And, you know, my era is more from 1980 uh, Empire Strike Back. You have to unlearn everything that you've learned, okay? So everything my parents beat into me physically about drugs are bad and this is bad and on, on, and on, I actually had to go back and actually take an analytical approach and look at it and actually change my views and believe it or not, change my, even my parents and other family members' views on it as well. Um, so Dr. Uh, Professor Nutt discuss, discussed a history a little bit about cannabis, but one thing people forget about is uh, go to the Bible uh, in Exodus. It's actually... Um, 250 shekels of cannabosum. Cannabosum is Aramaic for cannabis flower. So the holy anointing oil was actually made out of cannabis oil as well. So I don't want to argue with what's written in the Bible. Um, and just some, here's some old prescriptions. And even uh, Sir William uh, Osler uh, has been documented using cannabis in uh, migraine as well. So putting this all together, we talked a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, synthetic cannabinoids, and phytocannabinoids as well. Um, and sort of what they do and where they're derived from. The endogenous cannabinoid, I actually went back and, you know, I've only, I graduated medical school in 2004. I actually went back and pulled my old physiology textbook and there was nothing in there about the endocannabinoid system. So this is still something we're not being taught in our medical training as, w as well. But as we're all sitting here right now, we're all actually making our own forms of endogenous cannabinoids as well. And what it does is it helps us, you know, relax and maintain it. The, the endocannabinoid system is sort of like the body's thermostat. When something is low, it speeds it up. When something is fast, it slows it down. It regulates every single physiologic response in the human body. And as we learned earlier, it's done through this uh, G-protein mechanism, which is a negative feedback from the postsynaptic cleft back up to the presynaptic cleft um, depicted here. And as I said, it typically works as more so as a, a thermostat. Every animal on the face of the planet also has an endogenous cannabinoid system as well. And so every plant or every animal, you know, is affected um, by it and it can be stimulated or inhibited or it can be treated as well. Um, some of the sites of the cannabinoid receptors in the human body, 
pretty much every single muscle, bone, tissue, skin, lymphatics, everywhere in the human body has cannabinoid receptors in it. The, the, the size of this receptor system is just absolutely massive and it gets overlooked. And here we have a, a publication that was done by the uh, NIH talking about the therapeutic potential is almost, uh, affects almost every single disease is affected by the endogenous cannabinoid system, one way or the other. So uh, this doctor out of California, Ethan Russo, very uh, prominent individual in the cannabinoid uh, medicine, he actually did a, a, a publication here on the uh, clinical in, uh, endocannabinoid deficiency. So if we were to actually measure your own endogenous cannabinoids, people that suffer from diseases like multiple sclerosis, um, you know, schizophrenia, pain, you know, pick, pick your disease, if you actually measure their own endogenous cannabinoid levels, they would actually be low. And that was uh, what, what he sort of depicted here. Here's a list again of all those uh, disorders that um, can function from that. But also uh, Matsunaga, uh, Matsunuga, he did a study of we all have that friend that's the life of the party, the center of the tension, the people that we all love to be around. And if you were to actually draw their endogenous cannabinoid levels, they would actually be elevated. Um, and that's what, was what he showed here in this uh, research that they did. So things that can actually stimulate your own endogenous cannabinoid system, exercise, massage, physiotherapy, acupuncture, even orgasm stimulates your uh, endogenous uh, cannabinoid system. So an orgasm a day keeps a doctor away. And actually here was a study actually showing that. Um, that was actually published. So have at it. Uh, synthetic cannabinoids. So this is where I think a lot of people get confused because I get a lot of patients that come in and say, oh, well, I'm on the marijuana pill or I'm on the cannabis pill. And that should not be used. You know, that, that term should not be, be used because the, the, the synthetic cannabinoids or cannabis pill, such as, um, I don't want to use trade names, but uh, as we showed earlier, is one component, only THC, and it's not the whole plant. Um, in Canada, we have uh, Sativex uh, and Sesamet available. Epidiolex isn't cleared yet. Um, in Canada, we don't have that available. Um, but these are all synthetic isolates, um, in individual isolates of, uh, of the plant. Um, and key component here, when compared to plant-based cannabis versus the THC pill, patients hand down hands down, over and over and over again, would rather have plant-based cannabis rather than, uh, than the uh, prescription pill. So plant cannabis. So this is a picture of one of the greenhouses, actually uh, one of the smaller greenhouses uh, done locally where they actually grow it in a uh, medical environment. Um, so this is the complexity of plant-based cannabis is so, so vast, and that's what's hard for a lot of people to wrap their brain around. Um, it, it is one of the most complex medications that we have, period. And we're just starting to understand it, and uh, we'll get into that further. So again, you must unlearn what you have learned. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, cannabis is a brother to humulus, hops, which is used to make beer. So it's actually a direct, uh, I guess, brother or sister to, to, uh, to hops. And you have different species of cannabis, which in medicine, we're actually sort of stepping away from delineating different types of species, whether it's indicas or sativas and so forth, where now we're focusing more on specific ca cannabinoid profile and actually terpene profile as well. Um, here's another example of a large, this is a million square feet, I think, of a greenhouse, a medical greenhouse. This is what is, I don't want to say sold me on it, but when you go into one of these medical facilities, it is a medical facility. You gown up, you glove up. It's no different than walking into an operating room. It is a quite an impressive uh, environment where they're cultivating uh, medical cannabis on a large scale. Um, Canada right now has roughly 150 licensed producers that are cultivating cannabis. This is just one of them. Um, so if they can imagine that sort of scale model. But when we look at the plant, what we, we, everybody associates cannabis with that fan leaf that we always see, but that's not what we really focus on. What we actually focus on is more of the flower. And right here on the left-hand side, that's what the flower of the plant is. And when you take that flower apart, just like any flower, you get buds, and that's what you see is right there, those buds of the flower. When you look at them closer, you'll start seeing these little crystals on them, and these crystals are called trichomes. And we'll get a little bit closer, they just, and that's the trichome is where all the good stuff is. That's where all your cannabinoids, your THC, your CBD, your CBN, CBD, you know, pick all your, those letters, 
all of them are more in the trichome. They're not in necessarily in that green part of the plant or in that fan leaf that everybody associates it with. Uh, just another electron micrograph uh, of it as well. Um, so when we talk about cannabinoids, we're so fixated on THC and CBD, but there's actually about a, more than 100 different cannabinoids. There's THCV, CBN, CBG. CBA, and, and one by one we're seeing more and more studies that are coming out on, uh, uh, um, about each individual cannabinoid, and each individual cannabinoid, when mixed together, work synergistically as well. One thing that we also forget is cannabis has what are called flavonoids and terpenoids, which give it various different flavors and scents, and those are also medicinal and can affect the effect uh, that you get from cannabis. So if you have a cannabis strain that is, say, for instance, high in a specific terpenoid, it can be very sedating and mellow, mellow, or mellowing and relaxing. If you have a uh, certain cannabis strain that's high in another type of cannabinoid, it can be actually very uplifting and excitatory. And so you can actually sort of tailor some of those strains or chemovars uh, on the, based on the, the terpenoid profile. And because each one is individual, and then you're mixing them all together, you essentially have trillions and trillions and trillions of different potential combinations and permutations. And so that's where asking for you know, true evidence-based medicine of double-blind and randomized controlled trials is so difficult because the plant is so complex to be able to derive or pull out every single cannabinoid and every single terpenoid is almost, is, is impossible and there's no way it can be done. And so that's where as clinicians, we need to sort of retrain our way of thinking of depending only on evidence-based uh, research as well. We need to look at different uh, other uh, study uh, applications that were done. So as we brought in earlier, THC, very uh, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, anti-emetic, anti-spasmodic, and sedating, okay? THC is what gets you high. However, in the raw form, THCA, if you don't smoke it or vaporize it, 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 it's not impairing. Also, sometimes we need to have high dose THC um, in other conditions like cancer, for instance. Uh, THC is very anti-tumorial, but a patient doesn't want to be impaired all the time, but if you take THC in a suppository form, you don't get high at all. And you can get, so you can get all the medicinal benefits associated with it, with it but without the impairment. So these are all little tricks that have sort of been learned throughout the years that I had no clue about. CBD, CBD is getting a lot of uh, um, press lately, more so it's more, I would say, in vogue as we're seeing CBD infused soft drinks and CBD infused everything else. Um, and, but it does have its place in the sense that it's very anti-anxiety, anti-inflammatory, it's anti-antidepressant uh, anti anti as well. And I do use a lot of CBD uh, dominant products in uh, psychiatric patients as well. The flavonoids and terpenoids, uh, this is just an example of them. There's about 500. Myrcene is one of the most common ones. That's a very sedating sort of cannabinoid. So if you have a cannabis that's high in myrcene, that's going to be much more the mellow out sleep type cannabis. But for instance, um, limonene over there in the top right, limonene is very excitatory and uplifting. And so if you have a cannabis strain that's high in limonene, it's not going to be sedating. It's going to be more uplifting, and I want to get out and do things and feel better about doing things. Lanolol, very interesting. That is very anti-seizure. And so when we think about cannabis you know, being anti-seizure, a lot of the uh, CBD strains are high in lanolol, and that's a component with that anti-seizure component as well. So all the different pharmacological effects associated with cannabis, you know, this is what we're currently using it for. It's, it's very, very vast. What I try to, it took me a while to kind of wrap my brain around all these different cannabinoids and all these different terpenoids and what we call the entourage effect. And I, if you take THC, and what I'm trying to depict here is sort of the, an example of, say for instance, THC is the letter A, CBD is the letter B, THCV is the letter C. Well, how many, you know, it, within the 110 or 105 cannabinoids and the 500 or so t t terpenoids that you have, how many different combinations of, you know, terpenoids and can, uh, cannabinoids can you have within just one plant? For instance, you know, A, A plus B, A plus B plus C, A plus C, B plus A. And I actually was very bored one day, and I calculated, I did that permutation math <laughs> associated with it, and the number that you get of all the different combinations and permutation just within the plant itself is 8.08 .08 quingentillion. I had to look that one up. 
uh, I always put things into perspective. That means there is more combinations and permutations in cannabis plant than there is of liters of water in the oceans on the face of the planet. That's how complex this is. And that's why it's, it's, it'd be very difficult when people say, you know, I only want evidence-based double-blinded randomized controlled trials because there's no way you can get that and get all of those different combinations of permutations exact. Um, and so again, one of the most complex medications that we have uh, available to us. Some of the key point, uh, I'm just gonna just, we'll talk about dosing a little bit later. Uh, but there is a wide dosing range. It can be as low as 2.5 milligrams on THC. Upwards of some of the uh, anti-seizure dosing protocols are anywhere from 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram of CBD. So it is a vast range. And like anything, start low and go slow, especially when we're dealing with uh, THC. A good rule of thumb that I use is when prescribing THC, I do dose it in uh, 2.5 milligram increments on a cannabis naive patient, a patient that's never been exposed to it or ever tried it in their life. Um, a CBD dosing, I tend to do more so in 10 to 20 milligram increments. Um, so what we use uh, in medicine, actually I'm gonna kick over that. So again, people are always wanting to compare things, uh, where, where's the evidence, where's the evidence? Well, when statins come out uh, on to medicine in 1996, if you were actually to do a PubMed search of all the statin research that had been published on PubMed in 1996, there was 3,200 citations. Well, as of noon today, there are almost 20,000 <coughs> citations that have been published on cannabis. And I use today because essentially in the UK, we're just starting. You know, this is no different than when statins just started in 1996. But yet a lot of clinicians, we tend to, we tend to use that focus of, well, there's not a lot of research. There's not a lot of research. Well, there's a heck of a lot more research now in cannabis than there was in statins. And statistically speaking, I think 30% of this room is probably on a statin at currently. Um, different delivery methods, you have cannabis flowers, the bud themselves, you have cannabis oils, different tincture, tinctures, uh, salves, creams, suppositories, it's getting into foods and beverages. Uh, methods of delivery, whether it's uh, inhalation uh, through smoked or vaporizing, um, we tend, we'll never condone smoking cannabis, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, versus oral ingestion and different bioavailability uh, associated with it. Um, transdermal absorption. The, the versatility of the delivery methods of cannabis is, is impressive. You can, you can inhale it, you can ingest it, you can apply it topically. You, I mean, it's, it's, it's endless of all the different uh, delivery methods that are available. Um, you might want to write this guy's name down, Dr. Donald Tashkin. He was the director of pulmonary critical care at the uh, National Institute of Health. He was one of the guys that brought down Big Pharma. And he did an interesting study on cannabis and actually smoked cannabis, not vaporized cannabis. And cannabis actually is a bronchodilator. And so we actually used inhaled cannabis for patients that have emphysema, that have um, COPD, asthma, et cetera. I have no hesitancy prescribing inhaled cannabis to a patient with emphysema or COPD. In fact, they actually tend to do better on it. Um, he actually did a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine where he compared smoked cannabis um, to smoked tobacco to non-smokers. I mean, the fact that I'm not a smoker, I don't smoke anything, but the fact that I have lungs, I'm at risk for lung cancer, whether I like it or not. If I smoke uh, one to two packs a day, I have an, eight, or I have an eightfold increased risk of developing cancer. If I uh, smoke, whatever, two packs a day, I have a 20-fold increased risk of developing lung cancer. But if I smoke the equivalent in cannabis per day, my uh, incidence of developing uh, lung cancer is two-fold less than non-smokers. So that's cancer preventative, which, you know, so here this, and that's smoked cannabis. And we'll never condone smoking anything, but we do mammograms and pap smears for prevention of cancer. You know, we'll never condone smoking cannabis to prevent cancer, but very interesting study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and there it is. So yeah, please go pull it. Um, Inhaled cannabis versus uh, ingested cannabis. This would be an example of a vaporizer that we would use. It's a little handheld device, no bigger than a cell phone. Um, when you inhale cannabis, uh, the, the dotted line there on the, uh, uh, with the quick uh, peak, very fast onset, usually kicks in within two to five minutes, but it has a short lifespan of only maybe two or three hours, and so uh, you end up having to do it again. Whereas when you ingest cannabis, 
Um, it's absorbed systemically, very slow gradual onset with a slow gradual offset um, there. Now what we use cannabis in medicine, so in immunology, there are several studies that were done where they did uh, simian in, um, uh, the equivalent of the, the monkey equivalent of HIV, where in using cannabis it reduces viral loads. And if you think back into history in the late 80s, early 90s, that was part of the, the reintroduction of cannabis back into medicine was to treat HIV wasting syndrome, because patients were actually feeling better when they were on it. And we've actually seen it in animal models where we're actually reducing viral loads associated with it. And several studies have been done on that. Um, in, in pain, you know, pain is the medicine we all love to hate. Um, right now, 3.9 million Can Canadians suffer from pain. We are suffering from an opiate epidemic in our country and in all of North America right now. Um, and so what we do see is uh, cannabis has a, a uh, modulates the mu and uh, delta or opiate receptors as well. So. We find that patients that use cannabis and opiates as well, you get more of a synergistic effect in the sense that the opiate is more efficacious. Um, and so we're able to start seeing a reduction in their dosing of their opiates. And actually patients are actually happier and have a better quality of life once we start titrating them up on their cannabis and titrating them down um, off their opiates as well, and that's sort of that cannab cannabinoid opiate uh, synergy that we do see that's been published. Um, deaths associated with opiates, yeah, opiates kill more people than all illegal drugs combined, um, so it's still a huge issue. Um, we do see that uh, you do see a, almost a 25% um, reduction in opiate overdoses in areas that have introduced cannabis uh, into sort of mainstream uh, medication. Um, one interesting thing that we keep forgetting about, harm reduction, it is completely impossible to overdose and die on consuming too much cannabis. Okay, the amount that you would have to consume would crush you in weight and kill you <laughs> rather than um, you know, ca causing any sort of physiologic response associated with it. Now granted, you can get impaired by THC and walk into traffic and get hit by a bus, and you can do that after a long night at the pub with the buddies as well and having too many beers. But as far as a direct you know, lethal dose, no, there's, there's not, you, you can't. And I bring this up because you know, I, where Windsor is, we're just right across, right across the border from Detroit, where the Detroit Lions play as American football, and the, the field there holds a capacity of 65,000 people. Well, in 2017, there has been over 70,000 overdose deaths in the US. You know, and then that would be like an entire, not to downplay some of the world atrocities going on, but a, a bomb going off at a sold out crowd at one of our football games and killing everybody there. And imagine what our countries would do to make sure that didn't happen again. But yet it happens every year and that unfortunate number of overdose deaths continues to go up and up and up and up and up. Um, and again, again, just more studies that I, and that I want to sort of throw in there so people can see that there actually is published evidence that's out there. Um, on using cannabis with opiates and, and so forth and pain and harm reduction associated with it. Cannabis and dementia, very interesting uh, what we're seeing here. Um, some of the cannabis in, uh, in dementia, hands down, beats all, a lot of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, prevents the uh, amyloid uh, plaque buildup uh, that, that's happening with certain dementias and actually has been published multiple times over. In fact, in head-to-head -head against your conventional acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, beats it hands down, to where now certain countries are actually using this in nursing homes. Instead of using the conventional antipsychotics to you know, calm down a, uh, a, psych a patient that's aggressive or agitated, use cannabis instead. And so we're no longer having to prescribe those antipsychotics that we're not supposed to be prescribing to the elderly population, but we do anyways because we lack resources. Um, more evidence on uh, using uh, cannabis in, um, in the elderly population. These are all the medications that we should not be using, but we do use, and, and you can replace all of these with, uh, with cannabis. And we do have a few nursing homes that are now using this as well on a lot of their patients. Um, this was actually a documentary that was done by Dr. Sanjay Gupta for CNN, where he actually went to Israel. and. They literally do that. They come around with a cart and they have their pills and here's your Lipitor and your Crestor and here's your quarter gram of cannabis and you go sit by the window and you smoke it and that's it. But their incidence of chemical restraints or physical restraints are almost non-existent uh, because of that. Um, 
again, here's some published evidence or published studies that were showing uh, use with uh, cannabis in Alzheimer's patients. Gastrointestinal disorders, I get a lot of referrals from the gastroenterologist that you do have CB1 and CB2 receptors in the gut. Um, this was a small little study that was done where they looked at uh, pain scales or different scales within um, uh, uh, different issues that we have with gastrointestinal disorders. So stools per day would be red is not on cannabis and blue is on cannabis. So patients see a reduction in the stools per day. And pain, not on canna red is not on cannabis, blue is on cannabis. You see a significant reduction in pain. You see a reduction in nausea. You see a reduction in vomiting. You see a reduction in fatigue, depression. Appetite, wow, you see a stimulation in appetite. Wow, the munchies works, okay? So you can get an appetite uh, stimulation. But this is, the next slide is very interesting. Weight comparison, you would expect the weight to go up, okay, because, oh, you're stimulating your appetite, your weight's gonna go up. But no, you don't actually see that. It actually kind of stays about the same. And in fact, think about it, you know, think back to the hippies, they're skinny little people, you know, um, because they're not obese. And part of the, it is speculated that part of the reason is, well, your activity also increases as well. And so you do see this where you're seeing an improvement in activity. Flare-up frequency is decreased and severity is decreased. One of my practices I have, I have a, um, I do a lot of dermatological uh, pr uh, procedures and I see, I started seeing a lot of the uh, dermatological conditions clearing up, you know, the actinic keratosis clearing up, uh, verrucas and seborrheic keratosis just sort of start sloughing off. And so sure enough, you know, there's been multiple different studies that are showing where it actually helps, you know, modulate that and, and slow those growths down. I actually did this uh, to my wife. My wife had a basal cell carcinoma growing on the side of her nose. We applied cannabis oil uh, to it. I had, uh, took a dermoscopy slides of it. Um, 10 days after, dermoscopy, complete change. Basal cell carcinoma gone. She didn't require an excision of it. Um, little other little keratotic, keratotic lesions on the cheek. I see them clear up all the time. Cannabis and cancer, very controversial. We use cannabis uh, for a lot of side effects associated with treatments of cancer, but we can also be using it as adjuvant treatment in addition to conventional uh, chemotherapy and radiation, surgery, et cetera. Um, and what we use cannabis for um, in, in certain types of cancers. Can cannabis, especially THC, THC is also very uh, anti-mitotic, anti-neogenic, um, uh, pro-apoptotic and anti-tumoral because if you think about cancer, cancer is just a cell that, just, that don't know how to turn off. They just keep producing cells more and more and more. The physiologic response of the endocannabinoid system is it regulates any sort of phy physiologic response. So it tells it to slow down. Hey, stop producing all those cells that you don't need to produce anymore. So it actually does slow things down. Um, and again, multiple studies that were in related to uh, cancer treatments uh, in addition to using cannabis. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of studies. This was actually uh, five different studies that were done where they used cannabis as in addition to conventional chemo radiation and conventional treatments. And you do get that synergistic effect of one plus one equals seven instead. So when you're mixing cannabis in addition to conventional um, uh, chemotherapeutic agents, it works actually very well in addition. This is actually my own patient. Um, she was one of my first patients, a uh, nice big tumor right there in the right upper lobe. She uh, had COPD. She was not a candidate for a surgery uh, because she would not have survived given the extent of her COPD. She did six months of chemo and radiation, was basically made palliative and told by the oncologist, there's nothing more we can do. Go make amends with what you need to, to get done. We'll see you quarterly for maintenance chemo. She made her way into me. Um, I started her on a, a mixed blend of CBD THC. This was earlier on where uh, you had to make your own oils. Um, her son is a uh, very accomplished chef, so he was actually able, able to make some oils out of the plant. And that's in just one year. With nothing else, she stopped chemo and radiation because it wasn't working for her. So what we have here is April 2015, that's her CT scan, uh, June 2016. So cannabis. As a scientist, can I prove that it was a cannabis that did, the cannabis that, did that? No, I can't. You know, I, I can't prove that. As a human being, pretty remarkable. Uh, this is not my patient, this is a, a, a colleague of mine, 16 month old, inoperable brain tumor. Parents didn't want to do the chemo, radiation, et cetera. So they did uh, cannabis oil on the pacifier and as you can see the serial uh, MRIs, tumor's gone, kid is doing great. 
Uh, risks, we, 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 we talk about the risks all day, but we, I can talk about the benefits a heck of a lot more. The risks, obviously, THC, yes, it could be a pairing, um, which apparently is the, the fear of everybody, but it's actually not that scary. Um, we prescribe a lot of medications that are impairing as well, and it's also dose dependent. I mean, obviously, higher doses, more impairing, et cetera. Uh, limitations, well, we do. Cost is a huge, uh, so, uh, especially for us. Um, you know, Canadians, we're not used to paying for any of our medications, and we have to pay for cannabis, and so it can be quite costly for some families. Um, so, in closing, this used to be my view of cannabis. And this is what a lot of our views of cannabis, you know, Cheech and Chong, Up in Smoke, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, uh, Reefer Madness. But when I started prescribing cannabis, this is what I was worried about, this sort of patient demographic. You know, if I open my door, I'm going to get every single stoner in the city wanting to come in to get a script so they can stay at home and play video games and do nothing. And it absolutely has not been that. This is my patient demographic. In fact, my average patient, uh, the average age of my patients are 55 and older. Um, it, it's quite remarkable what I see and some of the, the results that we do get. Um, so to, to leave you uh, with a quote from uh, Galileo, in questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. And uh, that's it. <laughs>